Good morning, church. Welcome to our 9 o'clock service here in the sanctuary. I ask uh, Brother Steve to come up. He's going to open our service from our deacon, and then we're going to continue to worship the Lord together. Brother Steve. Good morning, people. Uh, the deacons would like to uh, express their appreciation and thanks for how uh, the congregation has responded to the mitigation efforts that we put in place to protect us as we started back to church. We just want to thank you. It, it has been a, a very good uh, outcome, and uh, we want you to know that this situation is temporary. We are studying the data to see when we can lift the mitigation restrictions. We're not there yet. We're headed in the right direction. So uh, that's where we're headed, and uh, keep your mask on today until you hear otherwise uh, throughout the entire church. And also, uh, you know, we're moving into the Easter season. So uh, prepare your hearts for this most important uh, day and event in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you all very much. Thank you, brother. As our vocalists come up to join our orchestra, let's sing to the Lord together. Let's all stand, church. All together. You may be seated. Well, good morning. I am so proud of y'all. Y'all made it to church this morning. Even without that extra hour of sleep, we normally have low attendance Sunday on this day. But we're so glad that you're here, especially if you are a guest. We would just love to meet you after the service in our hospitality suite. You go through either of these doors and up the ramp, but we'd love to get to know you. And if you have any questions about our church or if you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. We've had a lot of people join in the last few weeks, so come visit us uh, up 
up there. Now, if you'll take a look in our bulletin, we have a lot of things going on. We have a, a disaster relief team leaving uh, today for a disaster relief trip, and we want to be praying for them. We'll do that in just a little bit. But I want to remind everybody that we're starting Sunday school back today. And so if you need a Sunday school class, if you'll just make your way to the Welcome Center, they will tell you how to find one. So God bless you, and let's keep our worshiping. It's the only way, church. We trust him with all our heart, and we obey everything he says. Amen? That's how we have joy and peace in life. We're going to read through Psalm 86 together this morning. When you see the words on the screen, I ask that you read them loud and with confidence as we read God's word together, church. Hear me, Lord. Answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you. Lord, they will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. Let's worship the Lord and sing today. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O friends of peace. That is what I want to do. Give you praise. 
Almighty God, we do worship you this morning, for there is none like you. Lord, we're so grateful to be in your house to worship today. Lord, to fellowship with other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, to sing your praises. Lord, to hear from you in the word that you have us for today. Father, we don't take that for granted at all. Father, we're grateful for Sunday school starting back today. And and how important that is. I can't believe it's been over a year since we've been able to meet together like this, Father. Um, well, not a whole year, but Lord, Lord, you know what I mean. And Lord, I just, I'm so grateful, Lord, for our missions trip, Lord, going out today. Father, just being able to go out and take the good news of the gospel. And Father, we just ask that you just speak to us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Every step I take forward, the past tries to follow, reminding me of what I have been. Mistakes and transgressions, and those unlearned lessons I've gone through time and again. I know God can't recall what He's cast in the sea that's easy for him but so hard for me but there'll come a day when I see him in glory then I'll only recall Calvary's side of my story where my sins were forgiven and my salvation was born guilt reminds me to look behind me my regrets want me to spend time with them but when i stand in his presence and he says welcome home every memory of faith Sins 
talented men in the church. God bless you. Well, thank you so much. I ran upstairs a minute ago because we have just one adult Sunday school class meeting this hour. Everyone else has the next two hours. It, I was so blessed. The room was just exactly as we laid it out, so there'd be spacing, but a great crowd there. So I think that bodes well, uh, especially on daylight changing, daylight Sunday. I welcome people down there, and that's a younger crowd, so I'm going to have the privilege of twice today welcoming people to the 9 o'clock service because some of them are thinking they're coming to 9 the next hour because they didn't <laughs> set their alarms. And so, uh, but it's good to see you here. I just want to mention one thing before I get us into the Word of God again. Last year, this is the year anniversary of when we shut down just so suddenly. Last year, we shut down just as we were ready to take our North American Mission Board offering. We take a Christmas one for international missions. We take one that leads up to Easter for North American missions. And that just got shut down. And because of that, our North American Mission Board did not receive a lot of the funding it normally gets. You'd be praying this next month about what you can add and give sacrificially toward reaching North America for Christ. We're studying the book of 1 Thessalonians on Sunday mornings. We're in chapter 1, and I'll be reading verses 4 through 7. And I do welcome those listening on WHKP and those who are watching us online as well. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 7. Excuse me. That's not it. Yes, it is. Here's my problem. I've already been working on the other one, the next one. All right. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 7. We'll do it right after we remind each other of the gospel by quoting John 3, 16 and join with Christians all over in praying the Lord's Prayer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. You have become followers, other translations say imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. When I read verse 4 and came across a word that puts terror in the heart of so many Christians. Others were saying, finally, we're going to hear a sermon on the truth. It's the word election. That's a synonym for predestined. And basically what we have is this, that's one of the most divisive subjects in Christianity. It's one of the hottest subjects today. So I want to share with you, chase that rabbit down a little bit before I look at the subject of today's sermon. I want you to know that as I study the Bible, I'm convinced that the Bible teaches both predestination and free will. The Bible teaches both predestination and free will. I'll give you verses on each one. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want a single soul to be lost. 2 Peter 3, 9. Ephesians 1, verse 4, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So before he ever created the world, he picked me, but he doesn't want anybody to perish. So 
basically, what, when I look at that, I say, how in the world do you put those two together? Can, can I just make an observation? I think we need to recognize that God is bigger than our minds can put together. He's, he's bigger than our systems of theology. I, the one thing I'd like to plead with those in the predestination camp, and the one thing I'd like to plead with those in the other camp is this. Would you at least both recognize that both sides have verses? Uh, I don't know how they fit together, but somehow they do, because if I could understand all there is to know about God, then God would be as small as my mind. Uh, Spurgeon said this, how do you reconcile, uh, Cliff, you going to find a place there, brother? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Spurgeon said, how do you reconcile predestination and free will? And he said, you don't have to reconcile friends. They're both in the same Bible. Calvin said this, he said, the Bible is God's baby talk. In other words, God's so much bigger than what we can conceive that we've got to understand him trying to explain himself to us is like us as grandparents or parents trying to explain to our children. Uh, not long ago, Karen and I went to see our children in, in uh, Charlotte. Uh, they have two foster children. One of theirs is five years old, Jatari, and he's at the questioning stage. And he followed me like glue the whole time there. Why, Papa? Why, Papa? Why, Papa? Why? That'll bless you, won't it? I mean, how can you explain things to a five-year-old? And sometimes I just say, you know, Jatari, you're just going to have to trust me on this. Because you can't explain everything to a five-year-old mind. There's some things beyond that mind. I, I preached this sermon on Thursday to the crowd that comes when I tape. And one of the ladies came up to me and said that she had told that to her grandchild. And said, I don't know. And the grandchild said, well, then ask your phone, grandmama. <laughs> Because you'll find out everything if you just ask your phone. <laughs> Let me tell you what I do when it comes to predestination and free will. When I'm on a predestination verse, I go, amen. When I'm on a free will verse, I go, amen. I don't try to figure it out. I just amen them. But can I say this? Rather than trying to figure it out, I think what we ought to do is see how it impacts our life and see how it ought to bless us. Because basically, this is what it means when it calls us the elect, the predestined. What it means is that God picked you before you picked him. What it means is that God made the first move. In 1903, there was a railroad camp in Tennessee. They were laying new lines. They were out in the middle of nowhere. The camp was filled with all men. Uh, all of those men were lonely. They longed to one day be married, but tch, no candidates out there. And they heard that the man in charge of the camp, his sister who was single, was coming. Her name was Virginia. And so they knew that she would come and arrive where their tracks were being laid. And so every man in the camp that day took a good bath. They picked flowers. They were holding flowers. Many of them had gifts. They were standing there at the railroad tracks waiting to meet her. When, when she got off the, the train, she was on the arm of Matthew, no, Ben Burrell. Ben Burrell was smart. He took off and went way down the line and got on the train first. And he had his gifts and his flowers, and he met her and he wooed her. And so she was on his arm when they got off, and they married and had five children in their lifetime. I can look back over my life, and I can see how God went after me, how God pursued me. I believe God, in his providence, moved my family and I to Macon, Georgia, where Campus Crusade opened the very first high school ministry they'd ever opened. We were there for that. I believe God put it on the heart of that senior in high school that I talked about a week or so ago who invited me to go to the Campus Crusade meetings. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, is I wrestled with God for months while I was going there. And I felt the pull of God until finally, after four months of wrestling with God, I gave in. I, I know that he made the first move. Other translations take this word, the elect, and they've, NIV, CSB, ESV, they have made this word chosen, knowing that you are chosen. So I'm going to focus on that particular translation of this word and talk about the fact that if you are a Christian, we are God's chosen one. Now, let me tell you how that will bless us. I still haven't got to the sermon yet. I'm still in the introduction. Let me tell you how that ought to bless us, that we are chosen ones, that God picked us. Hey, folks, have you noticed it's open season on conservative Christians now? We are more and more being rejected by the world. We're the only religion you can really criticize. 
Uh, it's interesting to me that the Muslims get a free pass when what they believe about women, which should be considered repressive by many of the folks in the media, but they, they've been given a free pass. Uh, what they believe about homosexuality, if you're a, a Muslim in a Muslim-majority country, you're going to be stoned to death if you're found to be that. And yet, they're given a free pass. The only ones you're allowed to, to criticize are us Christians. But I think what God wants us to do, because... I'm meeting Christians who are losing their jobs. I'm meeting Christians who are losing their friends because of their stand. And we're going to be more and more rejected. I think what we ought to do is we ought to poke our chest out and say, the world may be rejecting me, but God picked me. I'm his. I'm one of the chosen ones. And it ought to be something that encourages us. Now, one more thought as I give this introduction before I get to the sermon. Here he says, knowing therefore your election of God. Paul says, not only can you know that you're one of the chosen ones, but I should be able to know that you're one of the chosen ones. So one of the question on the floor today is, how do you know if somebody is one of the chosen ones? And I'll give you three things that he says in these verses that indicates that somebody is one of God's chosen ones. Number one, you can tell who are a part of the chosen ones by the way they respond to the gospel. In verse 5, he says, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Basically, in 1 Corinthians 1, it says, Your reaction to the gospel tells whether not you're on the road to perishing or whether not you're on the road to heaven. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to the, us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Now, let me make this clear. The gospel's not on trial. It is true, and it is the power of God. What's on trial is our heart reaction. Now, I'll give you an analogy. Ruth Ellen, you're a God-given, talented painter. God bless you. And I love your paintings, and they have spiritual meaning. So I, I don't want you to take this wrong. But I don't get art. Uh, I could not tell you right now what paintings we have in our house. Karen could let you know that I don't know what I'm sleeping under. I, I don't know what I'm sitting under. I just don't pay attention to stuff like that. Now, that's not on art. That's on me. I had the privilege of going to Amsterdam's most famous museum full of Van Goghs and Wimbrandt. I brought with me a Louis L'Amour novel. And so I just said, Karen, I'll find chairs. You tell me. I went painting, 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 painting. There I am. I'm sitting right here. And I didn't get Van Gogh. Now, let me tell you something. That, that says nothing about Van Gogh. That says something about me. Does, does that make sense? And that's the way it is. If you don't get the gospel, that's an indication of what your heart's like, not what the gospel is like. And so you can tell those who are getting the gospel, who, who, who are part of the chosen ones, because they get it. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul said this, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. He said it's, it's like there's a wall up with somebody who's not saved when it comes to the truths of the Word of God. The college I went to, there was a godly professor. I took every course he offered. One of the best Bible teachers I've ever sat under. And he did teach the required classes uh, you could get him for the Old Testament and New Testament survey at that college. And all over the state of Alabama, people knew that was the class you need to get. Uh, Baptists talked about it. We, you get to study the Bible with Dr. Bryan. So there was a young girl who grew up in Baptist church all her life, went to Sanford, went to the class. And after every class, the students were saying, wow, wasn't that incredible? And she was thinking to herself, I barely stayed awake. I'm getting nothing. So halfway through the semester, she made an appointment with Dr. Bryan. And she said, Dr. Bryan, I don't understand it. All my classmates are excited. Everybody at home said, wait till you get to your class. I'm getting nothing out of it. He began to talk to her about her soul. And together they discovered she'd never been born again. So he led her to Christ. The end of the semester, she walked up to him and said, this is the greatest class I've ever been in. Because God opened up her heart. So one of, the way that you can one of the ways that you can tell if somebody's one of the God's, God's chosen ones is look at how they respond to the gospel. Number two, you can tell those who are part of the chosen ones because they are becoming more like Jesus. They're becoming more like Jesus. Verse 6 says this, you became followers. The ESV says imitators of us and of the Lord. 
having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, you became imitators of the Lord. You're becoming more and more like Jesus. Now, now can I tell you two things practically from this verse about how you can become more and more like Jesus? How you can become true imitators? Number one is why don't you look at the life of Jesus? You know, we have four Gospels, and they don't begin with the cross. They, they, they take his whole life into account. And what you'll find, folks, is you become what you behold. If you have before your eyes the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're looking at his life, and you're watching how he dealt with people, you're hearing his sayings, you're taking it in. The more you look at Jesus, the more you become like him. So I encourage you, be reading the Gospels faithfully and regularly. But he said this, you become imitators of us and of the Lord. And the truth of the matter is, one of the ways that I can become more like Jesus, and one of the things that's helped me in the past is to find godly people and keep my eyes on them. I've seen Jesus in action to a great degree by watching godly people who reflect Jesus. And I've learned more in the Christian life. I've heard somebody say a long time ago, more of the Christian life is caught rather than taught. Will Houghton was the president of Moody Bible Institute. Before that, he was the pastor of Moody Church. In the 1940s, there was an agnostic who was thinking about committing suicide, but he wondered, is there a real one out there? He just didn't believe that preachers were real. So what he decided to do before he took his own life, he'd heard so much about Will Houghton that he hired a private detective to surreptitiously follow him everywhere he went to make sure he's for real. And when that private detective came back and said, this is a godly man, then he went to him and Will Holton had the privilege of leading him to Christ. And by the way, his daughter later became a student at Moody Bible Institute when he was president there. So how can you tell if somebody's one of God's chosen ones? They're becoming more like Jesus. But thirdly, how can you tell if somebody is one of God's chosen ones? You can tell who are a part of the chosen ones by the fact that they become an example for all for people to follow. Look at verse 7. After he said that you were imitators of us and of the Lord, he said you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia uh, who believe. Have you ever heard the old saying, you may be the only Bible that some people read? That's true. That as I live out the Christian life, people are watching me and they're watching you. And we get the privilege. And, the, and, and as you grow in the Lord, you become an example for other people to follow. We have the privilege of living out the Bible for people to see. In China, during the days when missionaries were allowed, there was a lady named Mrs. Paxton who was serving there. They had a compound hospital. And the, that particular day, the doctor who served that particular compound was gone. A man came in. He'd been severely cut in a work accident. And so Miss Paxton bandaged him up and said, now you're going to need to go every day, go, go find a doctor and see that doctor every day and change these bandages so you won't get infected and so he'll write. And so she did that. The next day, the man came back and said, I want you. <laughs> I don't want a doctor. I want you. Will you change my bandages every day? And she said, I'll change your bandages if you'll hear what I've got to say every day. And so every day, she started talking to him about Jesus as she changed the bandages. She gave him a Bible because he said, is there a book that tells all this? And she gave him a Bible. And so he started reading it, but he just couldn't get it. He says, I just don't understand this book. And as he was reading through the Gospels, one day he came back to her and he said, now I get it. He said, you know, you came from America to China to bring blessing to me, to help me, to tell me about God. You bandaged my cut. I just realized Jesus left heaven to come for me. And so he can make the connection between the sacrifice of the missionary to go to China with the sacrifice of the Son of God. He saw the two together. That Mrs. Mrs. Paxton had become an example that he could put his arms around. I am a huge golf fan, a horrible golfer, but huge golf fan. Let me show you the picture of the man that was my favorite golfer. His name is Payne Stewart. This was taken after the 1999 win of the U.S. Open at Pinehurst. If you go to Pinehurst, go to hole number 18. There's a great statue. 
uh, where he's in the same pose he did when the putt went in and he'd won it. That was his second U.S. Open. He'd also won a PGA. He, he kind of was a trendsetter because he had the Scottish type cap. And what's not showing there is he would wear something called plus fours, which they had the knee socks that kind of the old time golfers would wear. And that was his homage to the golf of the past. And so that's Payne Stewart. When he hit the tour, he was popular. He was always a people person. But his fellow golfers considered, considered him egotistic and sarcastic. One of his golfers said he was a frat boy when I saw him play in college. He's a frat boy now. I mean, there just wasn't a lot of seriousness or depth to him. But one of his best friends was Paul Azinger. And Paul Azinger is now the color commentator for uh, one of the networks. And Paul Azinger in 1993 was diagnosed with a case of cancer that could have taken his life. That shook up Paul, uh, shook, shook up pain, because here he is, he's not a Christian, had, had very little religious background, and he's got a friend that he might lose, and what happened was Paul Asinger comforted Payne Stewart, the man with cancer comforted the man who didn't have the cancer and said, it doesn't, it's all right, I'm a Christian, if I'm going to win this battle one way or the other, either I'll return to playing golf or I'll go to heaven, I can't lose. And then he said, Payne, do you have that kind of certainty? That caused him to think about spiritual things. At that time, he had moved to Orlando. So many of golf pros lived there, especially for the off-season experience. So his kids got involved in First Baptist Orlando's Christian school. And they started sharing with their dad things that they were learning. He had never had background, so they were new to him. Oral Hershiser, a great Los Angeles Dodger pitcher, started a Bible study for pros who lived in the Orlando area. And so he started attending Oral Hershiser's Bible study when he was in town, and God began working in his life. And you know what, folks? Very quietly, in 1998, he accepted Christ. Jesus began to change his life. And, and the other pros noticed an incredible change. At the beginning of 1999... His son, who was going to that first Baptist Christian school, gave him the bracelet that's on your wrist right, that you see on the wrist right there. It's a WWJD bracelet. What would Jesus do? And he wore it the entire season. When there at the end of the tournament, when he's gripping the U.S. Open, out there visibly, is the WWJD bracelet because he'd become someone who wanted people to know about Jesus. He held a celebration at his home after he'd won that, and he said, I don't want to be a Bible thumper, but I want you to know it was Jesus who did this. Jesus has done the greatest thing in my life, and that's more important for me to know, for you to know about Jesus than for us to celebrate my U.S. Open win. Unfortunately, you know the story. He was in a plane crash just a few months after that, but that means he's in heaven. And you can tell he's one of God's chosen ones because you see how he's hungering for God's word. You see how he's looking for people like Earl Hershiser and he's looking for people like Paul Azinger to imitate and follow. You can tell that he's one of God's chosen ones because wearing that bracelet reminds him people are watching. I've got to be an example of what Jesus would do. So here's my question as I draw this sermon to a close. Can people tell that you belong to God? Can people tell that you're somebody whom he saved? Why don't we think about that as we pray right now? Lord, I pray right now that your spirit would work in our hearts. I know for every saved person in this room, we just, your Holy Spirit's pulling us to be a witness, pulling us to make a difference. So we just yield ourselves to you. I pray our children and grandchildren will never have a doubt about us. Right now, friend, if you have doubts about your salvation, you can settle it right now. Just like Payne Stewart, you can accept Christ in your heart right now. Would you pray this with me if you've never done that? Say, Jesus, I need you. I trust you as my Savior. You've got me from now on. In Jesus' name, amen. We're coming now to the last song. Would you just sing this with us? And I'll be ready to dismiss us. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the
you so much for being here. God bless you. And I hope you've made plans to stay for Sunday school. That's happening over the next two hours. And I'm probably going to pop in and out a little bit. I know Dave will too because we're just excited about seeing Sunday school begin again. Look forward to what God's going to do in the coming days. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.